call this meeting to reference the uh, committee that we're on the committee. And today is Thursday, January 5th, 2023. And uh, we will roll call uh, introductions from the chair, Robinson. Kevin Cross. And those on the phone. Mr. Rivera. Felix Rivera. Mr. Sweet, Mr. Sold. Yeah, Randy just And then Chris, are you on the phone? Yeah, I'm here. Mr. Constant, okay. Christopher Constant. And then Mr. Salt? He's here. Uh, yeah. I'm here, Randy Salt. Okay, fantastic. Well, we've got a quorum then. So let's. Uh, Move on to some unfinished business from our last meeting uh, from December 1st, uh, 2022. And uh, talk a little bit about <clears throat> 2021-88S. Uh, unfortunately, Dean is not here with us today, and he was hoping to make some additional updates and amendments to this. So. We don't have that from him that I'm aware of. I didn't see anything from him in emails or anything about that. Uh, so is there anything else we that we need to have on your mind that you want to discuss about this one that's come up since our meeting last month, Mr. Cross? Not particularly. I was waiting for Mr. Gates to chime in so he could point out anything that was of uh, significant relevance. Okay. Up too much time reviewing it here on the spot. Yeah, I got, well, since Steve's not here and we don't have any changes that he sent to us, I guess we'll we can uh, keep this on the agenda for for our next meeting in a couple of weeks, and maybe we'll have we'll have some time to to work on that in the interim. And so let's move down to item B: a discussion about treating triplexes and fourplexes as residential versus commercial construction. And we had an initial discussion about this before. Um, yeah, I was hoping to hear from the building department regarding uh, any complications that poses. Um, and uh, perhaps we can do this in another meeting outside CDC. Um, what are the significant provisions that are complicated? Uh, we discussed this briefly last time, um, you know, not just that they're treated like commercial, but, you know, uh, perhaps, and, uh, you know, I, I, Volan and I were going, uh, we're discussing something similar on a different issue, um, <clears throat> which was some different ways that we could achieve this. One of that would be a series of pre-approved plans uh, that is done in other municipalities or other, in other cities, which is a... Uh, a set of triplex and fourplex designs that have been uh, rigorously reviewed um, with a bunch of options that are uh, pre-approved for construction. Um, of course, you know, removing parking minimums helps a lot. There's some other things that we can look at doing, but I'd, I'd really like a bullet point regarding what are the specific things that we can do that can make the small multifamily uh, units easier to construct. Um, and of course, maybe maybe the answer is not necessarily treating them like residential um, completely. Maybe it's a combination of you know uh, lot size requirements, things like that. What needs to be taken into consideration? But um, it'd be nice to hear from the uh, building department on on their thoughts on that and what kind of what kind of complications that creates. Okay. Anyone in, from the building department want to chime in or have a response to that? Here. We're from the planning department, not planning uh, building safety. This is really, in my opinion, it's really a Title 23 building safety issue, not a Title 21 Title 20 issue. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'll request a meeting with them. Uh, I've sent uh, another email to them requesting a meeting. Um, well, you know. With our, our aid, the current ADU um, 
ordinance that we have, it sort of turns duplexes or triplexes, or duplexes into triplexes and triplexes into fourplexes. If you know, I, at least I, the way it's written now, I think it, it would be able to do that. I think it only allows for a, an ADU attached to a single family or duplex. I don't think it goes beyond that. So, so you wouldn't be able to you turn a triplex into a, a fourplex? You could have a duplex with an ADU. Yeah. Right. Interesting. All right. I'm sitting in Lance uh, Wilbur, another email regarding a meeting for Title 23 changes. We'll just get a list of them together. Okay. If we do a meeting, deal with ADU, deal with other building safety issues that seem to keep popping up here at our CDC meetings. Okay. Shelly? I'm going to put Mr. Schutte, who just joined us on the spot, and ask him what he would see is the biggest um, roadblock to making that change. Uh, thank you. Yeah, not uh, Chris Schutte, uh, private consultant. Not necessarily a roadblock so much as uh, the way that the building code, particularly the IRC, the International Residential Code, is written, um, it is explicitly applicable only to single family duplexes. And because uh, that language exists in the IRC, um, by extension, residential building codes uh, are applied to anything single family duplex, and then you're kicked into the commercial uh, international building code if you go above that. Now, other jurisdictions have taken a unique approach to this, and um, just by way of background, you may remember this, Pete, and I'm sure Kevin does too. Every so often, there's a uh, new code update pushed out for all of the variety of codes, fire, et cetera, and local jurisdictions take those, read through them, either adopt them as they're written, or in the case of Anchorage, adopt them as written and then add on a handful of amendments to it that are unique to that jurisdiction. Uh, and we did that in 2019, I want to say, 2019, 2020. One of the ways that other jurisdictions have started to apply residential building codes to fourplexes and even up to sixplexes is by simply amending their local, locally adopted version of the International Residential Code. And um, I'd be happy to share some examples from other jurisdictions with the committee, but it's kind of a weird duct tape hack, if you will, to make uh, things besides single and duplexes uh, available under the IR IRC. And that, I think, is essentially what you've heard members of the building community, uh, from small builders all the way up to Cookland Housing, who does uh, quite a few triplexes and would love to do fourplexes. Uh, that, that has been an impediment to them because of the additional requirements that the International Building Code, the Commercial Code, requires. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's one way that local jurisdictions have, have modified their building codes to make sure that those allow for an easier path on the development side. Uh, and Ross can speak to it in greater detail, but just wanted to share that. Thank you. That's what an argument. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you doing? I'm Ross with the building department. Well, so uh, we, we were just uh, discussing treating triplexes and fourplexes as residential versus commercial construction. Mm -hmm. And so we're wondering what uh, well, you your department might think about that. So, I, you know, the difference between residential and commercial is uh, basically the fee factors, they, the, and, and hence the permit fee. And, uh, and the, they're different because commercial gets routed to more reviews than residential does. And um, like a three or a fourplex, uh, a single family home or duplex would get routed to addressing, to have an address assigned. It'd get routed to flood, to see if it's in the floodplain or not. It'd get routed to stormwater for the the the, the SWIP review, the the stormwater runoff pollution review, and um, and then would get routed to zoning for the land use review, and then it then it undergoes a building code review, you know, the IRC review, primarily a structural review. A three or four plex would get routed to those same reviews, plus it would get routed to right away. Um, generally, um, traffic 
and fire review, and a PD civil, which is primarily a site drainage review. So I, I did a fee comparison where I basically took like a, a 3,000 square foot house and a 3,000 square foot threeplex or fourplex, and the difference in the permit fee between those two would be, let's see here. So for the 3,000 square foot house, the permit fee would be around 6,800 bucks. And for the threeplex or fourplex, the permit fee would be around 8,800 bucks. So it was like roughly about 2,000 bucks more expensive for the threeplex or fourplex. Uh, those additional uh, review process, obviously the, the different criteria, um, I guess, what, what would that add as far as time? Generally, not much because those reviews, right of way traffic, fire, and PD civil, and so the right of way and traffic reviews generally get done pretty quickly. You know, there, there's not a lot that they're looking for. The fire review and the PD civil reviews can take longer because um, they're typically more backed up. Um, so maybe it could add like one to two weeks on the review time. Okay, so uh, it would be nice if we had somebody from the home builders here or something who can speak to some of the complications that they run into. <coughs> Perhaps some of that is on a lot size requirements or setbacks or something, yeah. but you know that obviously goes into drainage concerns. So, um, we might be on the phone. There's a couple of um, members on the phone. And I know we discussed having a conversation regarding lot sizes. Mm -hmm. and so some of those, un if, if we're complicating construction on some of those triplexes and fourplexes. <coughs> I'm wondering if there's anyone on the phone from the home builders who would like to uh, chime in and give us their opinion right now. Anyone online from the home builders? Kevin, I can set up the round table. Yeah. Would you please? I didn't, I didn't hear anything back from them, so I guess not. <coughs> so so there, there are some other nuances, too, between doing a triplex or a fourplex versus a single family or a duplex. And um, basically, unless you build a triplex or a fourplex as townhouses, where you have like these distinct units dirt to sky, yeah. um, you, you, you're, uh, you, you would, single family and duplex are built under the International Residential Code and townhouses are built under the International Residential Code or regulated, I should say. Um, but if you configure a triplex or a fourplex any way other than make it a townhouse, it's going to fall under the International Building Code, the IBC. And one of the, the first major threshold that kicks in is a fire sprinkler system. You have to have a fire sprinkler system in it. And the second threshold that kicks in with fourplex or more is accessibility, um, handicap accessibility. So. You know, that adds complexity and cost, obviously. So, so even if you, even a triplex has to have sprinklers? Uh, yes, if you build it as townhouses, three townhouse units, no, right? Because each townhouse unit has two hours of fire resistive construction between each dwelling unit. Right. It allows the fire department time to put that dwelling unit out before it catches their, their neighbor on fire, right. ideally speaking. Yep. Mm -hmm. But if you can, if you start stacking them or configuring them differently, then the fire sprinkler thing gets kicked. I should say, as a reference to the IRC, actually requires fire sprinkler systems for single family homes. All right, we just Anchorage amends that out. So the national code threshold is a, a sprinkler system in any structure where people are sleeping. Wow. Mm -hmm. and, and so we've done that here be, because of, of the problems with uh, freezing and, 
Yeah. Uh, probably more so money. Money. Yeah, probably, realistically speaking. Because, um, I, I mean, commercial. most commercial buildings have fire sprinkler systems. So we know how to put sprinkler systems in buildings so they don't freeze. We figure that out. Um, well, that's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know what, <laughs> I've heard people who were thinking about putting sprinkler systems in their, in their homes when they were building a single family <laughs> residence, but when they found out how much it was going to cost, they, they decided that they would do, look at other options. Yeah. yeah it you know, our assisted living homes, <coughs> um, they require fire sprinkler systems. And, and a lot of those are built just like a single family home, right? They're same size, same look, everything. Um, with the upgraded, them is the fire sprinkler system because they can have up to five people in these homes who aren't capable of responding to an emergency. Right. Yeah. Well, as you know, I spent 16 years in that industry, and uh, the biggest thing was just the uh, availability of more efficient materials that reduced your uh, flow characteristics for you know, distributing water. So you know, we went from iron pipe to CBVC, and then you know, they get uh, better distribution methods uh, I think it's important to note that fire sprinkler systems are more as a just enough to get out of the house, right? Uh, they're designed for the life safety area so that people can exit the property in time and give them some extra, you know, the, the necessary minutes they need in order to uh, to escape. Uh, are not necessarily designed um, to save the structure from burning, but uh, you know, reduce the risk in those high high risk areas. And so some of those changes to code and some of the um, advancements in the systems have made it more affordable. But, it, you know, it also requires a different kind of construction of the property because you don't want any of those, you know, it's not like a, it's not like a water faucet where you just run the water when it gets really cold to keep it from freezing. It's stagnant water in a system. So um, it requires that it's an interior walls. It can't run an exterior. So you need to be very cognizant about how they're installed. And, and those requirements then meet the limit design criteria because you may have some really nice aesthetic things about a property, but once you, in, once you add a fire sprinkler system to it, you know, you can't design it that way because where am I gonna put the pipe? I don't wanna run it in a cold wall. What does that look like? And so then eh, it complicates design and architecture. And so in, in, any kind of you add, anytime you have those burden, there's resistance. So, Mr. Chair, Mr. I, would, I would just add, we had before us probably two years ago, a request from the fire department to add sprinklers to the buildings process to accept the code as drafted and it was a financial argument that was made resoundingly to us and so the assembly assertively removed that requirement so it wasn't about the difficulty in the design although that is reality it was very simple calculus it was yeah. this is going to add 10 to 30 to 50 thousand dollars per building and that was not something that members were able to swallow yeah, I, when I was Union 669 with the sprinkler fitters, there was that um, contentiousness because the sprinkler fitters said these systems have to be designed by us, and our union paid us very well. And so we wanted those, we wanted to keep control of that fire protection system, but a lot of these systems, the Wurzrow and stuff, which are basically almost like PECs, are very, very simple to install now, and I think they could be done affordably. <laughs> But it all depends on who has the right to install it. So and that's the meat grinder of the public <laughs> process, because you run into that one and you will come out hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mr. Sol. And, and they can always, you can always still install one. Yeah. So no code doesn't require it. Yeah. Just from my knowledge, do they, do they glycol pack these so they don't freeze, or how do they, as just being excited and uh, go with that? I think the vast majority, they, they, they definitely want to avoid the glycol. And Expensive. And there, there actually has been issues with, with glycol um, in some of these older systems where, because like you said, that water sits in there for years, right? And so like that glycol and water in these systems and the, and the glycol and the water were separating. And I believe these were more like systems that were over a commercial cook hood. And then poof, they go off and they spray glycol on the fire. And that, I think they, there were actually some situations where these things flared off. Um, so yeah, so generally they're, they're water systems and generally you, you got to keep all the piping inside the thermal envelope. You got to be really careful about it, you know, how, how you route it. Um, 
Yeah, there's more expensive systems, dry pipe systems <clears throat> that use compressed air and then has an actuator when it senses a, a rapid loss. But all those require additional yeah. maintenance and controls. And even uh, polypropylene, which they use in glycol fire protection systems, deteriorates. Right. So every three to four years, you're having to drain it and refill it and pump it, and that's labor. Yeah. Which most people don't. Right. They don't maintenance it every two to three years, and then they have a surprise freeze, and they're like, what happened? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, in a commercial kitchen, you know, you, 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 it might be there 10, 15, 20 years and never have an incident, but then when, when you all of a sudden you have a fire, you know, if the, if the system hasn't been looked at in 15 or 20 years, you, 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 might, yeah. you might find yourself with a big flare up. And, and these, when sprinkler systems are required, there's also mandatory um, inspection and maintenance requirements to ensure that that they remain operational through time. Because we all know what happens when you put a mechanical thing in and you forget about it, right? <laughs> it's not going to work when you need it to, basically. Um, well, and, you know, the fire department, when they have time, go they go out and, and run inspections uh, in, in businesses and, and restaurants. They, have them. they used to come to my place when they had time when I was down on top of you know, Check to make sure that I had a fire extinguisher restored to me. Well, and make sure that we hadn't changed anything in the kitchen that created some sort of hazard. In that one. Well, the, the largest enforcer of that is your insurance industry because we're required to have annual inspections. If you have a freeze up or you have a mechanical failure, you try to do an insurance claim and you can't prove that you had it inspected, your insurance company is not going to want to pay on that claim because they can, they can say you failed to maintain negligence the system. That's negligence. Yeah. So you saw that a lot. Excellent. Well, we can talk more about this. I guess it'd be, uh, Julie, you're going to try to arrange a meeting. Yeah, I'll try. I'll work on arranging a round table um, and versus a work session. That'd that be fantastic. It can be a more collaborative environment. Okay. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Um, well, should we go down to new business? One, one more question. Oh, so. I, I'm blanking on who gave the presentation last night, one of the community councils, but it was around property value assessments, kind of starting that process yeah. again. Yeah. And was it four plexes are treated a little bit differently? If you build something with four or more units, you get a deeper property tax discount? I think we have to check with the assessor's <coughs> office. I'll, I'll, I'll take a look. Oh, are you talking about the tax abatement? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll take a look. There are a couple of different tax abatements. Yeah, and that depends on what part of town you're building in. Yeah. That type of thing I can send you those ordinances. And just as a footnote, it's not specific to four plexes, it's a unit count. Yeah. So four, four or better or something. Yeah, thank you. Before we move off this item, did we, have a, did we have a word plan for this? What's going to happen with this conversation about the treatment of triplexes and fourplexes? I'm going to set up a stakeholder roundtable. Yeah, through the chair, if I may add just a little more color to this. Go ahead. So um, I've been working in the building department for 25 years. When I started 25 years ago, we had two different per permit types. We had a residential permit that did single family duplex, and then we had the everything else permit that did everything else that was all commercial. Um, I. I I don't know why that line got drawn where it got drawn that, you know, one and two family. And my, my guess is knowing how these things evolved, I, my, I would guess that even decades ago, the Anchorage Home Builders Association probably played a role in setting up a permit for single family homes and duplexes that are less expensive than everything else. And I, I think that's probably the primary reason why single family and duplex get singled out is they get a, a permit fee that's less you know, and everything else. So I, I guess at the end of the day, I'm not sure what technical problem is trying to be solved here, but um, it, it, the, the issue may not be, oh, we, we're, we want to make three and four flex residential. Uh, it might be, or if the issue is really permit fees, um, tweak the permit fee. You know, you can tweak the permit fee structure and not really uh, impact the way that the building department does business because our, our systems, our permit tracking software, 
and stuff has just has been set up to just do business this way, you know, to treat residential the way residential is treated and to treat commercial the way it's treated, right? Um, so, yeah. yeah. So you think this, uh, at least a partial solution might be just a permit fee adjustment? If that's what the issue is, right? Yeah, I don't know who raised this point, but my, my guess it's a money thing. And if it is just a money thing, the money thing could be addressed without changing the way the department does biz, you know, functions. I, I wonder though if it's also a taxation issue, right? Because we have residential properties and commercial properties and we tax them differently. And so I think probably there are several areas in which this might be worthy of looking at beyond this is what comes to mind the building questions permitting the taxation I don't know what else you know cost of construction I don't know about cost of construction I think if it's going to cost what it's going because to cost the codes are well the codes are different yeah. you've got IRC versus IPC yeah so those are the things probably worth investigating mm-hmm yeah, that's where you need the home builders and those who mm -hmm. can say point specifically to these hurdles that they're facing. Because this came up in our uh, our housing workshop that we did. Uh, it was something that was brought up. Well, and of course that raises the notion of this should be put on the table for that conversation when we get to the summit. And as a whole genre of conversations, which we know it is, which is... Yeah, uh, through, the, through the cherry ups. So our split residential commercial doesn't doesn't even align with the IBC IRC split residential commercial right because if you're doing townhouses and if you've got three or more townhouses it's commercial if you have two townhouses it's residential however all townhouses are covered by the residential code okay um, problem the darn codes change every three years yeah. so we're all we're dealing with a moving target here for one thing right. um, <laughs> um, Anyway, and then and then after they they make the changes, then the local jurisdictions look at them and you know make adjustments too. I, I remember we spent uh, several committee meetings three years ago when when we were looking at you know making the update. And, uh, mm -hmm. Chris, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a. Uh, a common uh, request we've heard from assembly members, and, and Ross, I'm bringing this up since you're in the room, is they would love to see, uh, going back to your point about the two different uh, review paths that we take at IRC or IBC, mm -hmm. they would love to see a simplified diagram of what a project looks like. Uh, you listed off the various reviews that occur, and I think mm -hmm. most members aren't aware of those. Uh, I just, I, it's a common refrain that I hear, so whether it's in this venue, this round table that you're talking about, or at some point, uh, it might be helpful to to uh, draw that up on a board just in a simplified version because uh, members have asked those questions before what is the process so i have actually drafted that um, it, it doesn't really lend itself to a flow chart because there's so much explanatory information that goes with it but I, but i have drafted an outline of the entire building permit process from application to certificate of occupancy highlighting the plan review part of it because that seems to be the part that really is is under the microscope right now i guess we could say it's it's going through internal review and and once we're all good with it's nice clean and correct it, I'm, it'll be submitted to the assembly well that might be something that we might want to run uh, by the home builders when we're having this round table that we're talking about uh, and so they could take a look at it and see where they thought there might be an area that would would help them, and we can mm -hmm. see if we can work something out. That sounds like a reasonable idea. Yes. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you putting that together. That that was. Um, yeah, I'm thinking ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to create one and got lost. It didn't flow. It didn't. It looked like a pile of pickup sticks. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other discussion about triplexes and fourplex versus residential? 
commercial. If not, we can move further down the agenda to new business. Mr. Chair. And uh, I would like Mr. To add, Bassett. I'd like to add an item to that section we previously discussed, uh, which is the two-year cannabis licensing. Okay. Under new business, and um, all right, well, let's let's uh, let's talk about industrial hemp. Did you, did you have a uh, not me? That was my Chris. Chris. Yeah. So we have received some communications from members of the industry who are raising substantive concerns, and we'll hear from them soon. Um, I don't think they knew this was on the agenda, or they probably would have been here. Um, What's happening now, we have these CBD stores that are across town that are unregulated, and we specifically made them unregulated. And uh, there is a phenomenon that's occurring with the evolution of the industrial hemp industry that I'm told, I haven't seen it yet, that these CBD stores are now selling active THC products that are unregulated. And there are no age restrictions. A kid could just walk in and buy it off the shelf. The state is aware of this situation, but the state's wheels turn really slowly. And um, for example, according to the law, I believe it's like a less than point something percent cannabis, point less than a percent of cannabis is allowed to be in the product. And so they will make a cookie, for example, and they will put in five milligrams of active THC because it's an ingredient that grows in the industrial hemp at a very low percentage. And then they will add enough frosting that the product falls under that percentage but still has the dosage of the active THC product. Mm -hmm. And so... So it's in the frosting as well? No, no, it's you, know, you use the frosting to balance uh, the math so uh, that it falls okay. underneath the legal requirement. Percentage down. And, but kids can now walk into an unregulated marketplace. And what this is doing is providing an opportunity for people to avoid the tax structure, to avoid um, the regulation of the marketplace. And so I don't have details for you today to get into how this is gonna work, but I can tell you I have a meeting scheduled this month with the advocates to help understand specifically. And um, there may be some direct action to help motivate the state a little bit, like taking an 18 year old in to buy some active cannabis legally because there's no regulation for it. Now we have a separate licensing structure and so we can tackle this locally for ourselves. I don't have a work plan at this time. I'm just bringing this item to the table because it was emailed to us and it's a real thing. So that's the issue. Um, so this is sort of a black market for CBD <clears throat> or something? I would call it a gray market gray in the market. sense that it's state legalized through the industrial hemp program and it meets the legal requirements, right? But is it being abused? It's, I don't even, I don't, I don't even know if I can say it's being abused, but a child, a 10 year old could walk into a store and yes. buy this product because there's no legal structures around it. We don't want that. No. So, Chris? Uh, thank you. This is an interesting topic. Um, I recently spent time visiting uh, relatives in Illinois. Illinois has, a, has just recently legalized recreational marijuana, but prior to that, <coughs> actually developed a pretty robust CBD industry of its own. And in fact, it's similar to our marijuana industry. Here. There's really nice stores, they're somewhat pricey, lots of product selection. Um, I can see that a similar opportunity here for Alaska-based businesses who want to uh, deal in the CBD-only world. Uh, so as we think about ways to ensure that the THC content is balanced out, let's not close the door on legitimate CBD-based businesses. And I, that's a fine line to walk, and it's not my area of expertise, but I was very impressed with the uh, robust CBD industry in Illinois, and I think that's an opportunity for Alaska too. If I might, if I agree, and the issue is beyond CBD, it's the hemp products as a whole. It's an incredible new industrial market that can supplant, and up here we could grow enough 
for paper supply, for any number of things. And so I certainly am a strong supporter of the new agricultural marketplace that's been created at the state. We just need to make sure that we aren't creating a new unregulated psychoactive THC marketplace in this town. It's hard not to manage one. Yeah, we, we could be the hemp paper capital of the world. <laughs> hemp, hemp ships. Mm -hmm. That we could send those containers back. Ted Stevens once said to me at a dream that, literally a dream, that the Yukon Cusco Corn Delta was a giant wheat field. <laughs> nice. Might have been that dream. <laughs> Might have been that dream. So. Any well, help? It's, 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 yeah. Maybe, maybe it's, a, it's a hemp field. Right. Industrial hemp. Supply the world. And times change, and you have to adjust with the changing times. Makes sense. So, Makes sense. All right, so what is, the, what is the action that we need to take on this? Nothing yet. Uh, be prepared that at a future meeting we'll have a more thorough briefing and a proposal for action coming soon though. Well, right. and, and so my question that just came to the top of my mind is, is is the Anchorage Police Department aware of this? I mean, you know, are, are they technically capable of, of testing this to, to prove that it's illegal? Do we? And I don't know that it's illegal. That's the thing, it's legal. Oh. Because what they've done is under the law, the hemp products are allowed to have a percentage of active THC less than a percent. It's a small amount, right? And so if you have a cookie, you add enough ingredients so that it's less than That's a percentage. that percentage number of the actual product, then it's legal. There's no regulation there. And this is more of a code enforcement you know, that's where this is at. It's not going to be the law enforcement side that's going to be um, approaching these issues because from a law enforcement perspective, it's a ticket. If you're doing it and it's in that way, it's, it's no big deal, but it's the code enforcement side selling illegal products, but at this point, they're legal and it's a loophole. So again, I just am, I know we'll see a video of a child purchasing this product just to demonstrate to people the problem we have. Is the um, has the ASD chimed in on this? Has this become no, I don't think they're aware of it. Yet? Yeah, I don't think they're aware of it. They didn't be made aware. Well, I don't know how available these products are. Again, I think we need a briefing before we create a moral panic. Let's yeah. get our full information um, soon, like next month. I'll make sure we have a briefing. Well, well also in code, if I'm not mistaken, is that out-of-state products are not allowed to be sold here in Alaska. Everything here related to the marijuana industry is supposed to be grown locally here. Except I think the CBD products, there was an exemption made and the hemp there might be under the state law. Now it's a whole new world. And it doesn't matter if it's grown here or out of state, if it has that percentage, even if the five milligrams of active THC is in the product, it's still going to be, at this point, legal. And again, we have the, the right to regulate this product locally, and so we will look at our laws and figure out where our place is. We might have to help the state to get there. And it's fine if they drive to the Matsu to get their children legal access to buy. <laughs> marijuana, but I don't think it's fine for Anchorage, and so we'll come up on this here pretty soon. All so right. that work plan is, stay tuned. Okay. All right, well, it's, it's, it's on our radar screen at this yep. point, so. Um, Mr. Chair, <coughs> should we, we just Mr. A, quick, a quick follow-up question uh, for anybody who might know. Have we, have you guys established a relationship with uh, AMCO, new AM, newish AMCO director, and if not, yes, maybe invite to this meeting? Yes. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Strong working relationship. Thank you. Can I add something? By the way, I don't know if you've seen the public notice, but they have put out public notice of a proposed regulation change, um, a little bit unrelated, but they're proposing to allow um, sidewalk permits to count as part of the licensed premises. So that's only for alcohol. Not marijuana. Right. Yeah. That's yes, um, on the alcohol. So whereas previously it had to be under a lease, 
for ownership um, for like outdoor seating. Um, they're proposing to allow sidewalk permits. So you will have a legislative package yeah. coming forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're in discussions yeah. and development of it, and pretty soon the, the planning department will be looped in because obviously you have to execute it, but know that it's an emerging concern. The public comment period for the state regulations closes, I think, on January 28th. We're looking to draft a resolution in support of it. They made the change because we asked for it, and um, it's just the AB 14 process that we, uh, AB 14? Yep. Yeah, that allowed them to, uh, during the pandemic, serve outside because of the way most properties downtown don't have their own park, parking spaces and the sidewalks they don't own ideas. Let's let the downtown do it too. So that'll be coming soon as well. All right. Any, any other discussion on industrial hemp or CBD imports? Yeah, so to your point, if I might, Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, thank you, Mr. Chair. It wouldn't just be AMCO. There's now a state industrial hemp office, so we would probably want to have all three parties, us and those two, in the room. Thank you, Pete. Okay. All right, let's move uh, down the agenda to discussion of permit and development fees. Is that something that you want to discuss, Mr. Cross? Yeah, so this is something I've been hearing, um, and I'm sure, uh, I, I don't know if everybody's been hearing from this, but from multiple contractors, and from uh, Anchorage home builders, and from our commercial contractors. So I've got basically a little synopsis here. So starting in 2019, um, first it's important to understand that your permit fees are based on ICC evaluations, right? So they come out with an estimate, and there's a there's a I've got the flowcharts for the last four years. But the ICC releases this document; it's a two-page document, shows what the price per square foot, and then our permit fees are based on those construction costs, cost per square foot. Okay, in 2019, the costs went up basically 20 to 25 percent across the board. Right now, at the time going into 2020, the mayor at the time instituted a 25 percent discount for the year because of the pandemic. So basically, there were no fee increases going to 2020. So we had 2019 kind of sit flat. Although they went up 25%, they gave a 25% discount, so it sat flat, right? Um, the last two years, those valuations continued to escalate. And then we have also the 2019 and the reduction kicking in. And so we've got some compounding effect. In a sense, what we have is from 2019 or over the last uh, two years, we see an increase of about 65% across the board. Okay, um, where in, in the 2023, they're expected to go up another 11%. Okay. So we're looking at dramatic fee increases uh, for, for construction, but at the same time, uh, we've increased, um, you know, we've increased uh, fees, I mean, uh, penalties on fees and uh, increased, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, fines and levies. And so the contractors, some of our commercial contractors, while they're waiting for plans approved, as I'm sure that they're, they're well aware, um, begin construction before they have their plans fully approved and permitting, because sometimes during the peak hour, peak times during the summer, it can take a really long time to get plans approved. And so they push that, so they increase the fines on those. Um, uh, but the point is that they've got significant increase in fees when we're offering the same, if not reduced, level of service. So the contractors are, are really concerned over how much it's gone up and how much it continues to go up. So what I'd like to do is another round table, what we do is uh, I would like to move this forward to talk about what those fees look like, the unintended consequences, what the costs are construction, and whether do we, what are our options? Do we reestablish our fee structure? Do we just say, well, that's too bad. It's just gonna be really, really expensive moving forward because of inflation and all these construction costs, the formula we've decided to align ourselves with um, and just business as usual, or do we amend some things? Do we enact another temporary decrease to allow things to adjust? What are some, what are some things that we can control while maintaining adequate services, but you know, uh, and good for us, by the way, good for the muni that we're probably gonna see things very profitable, but extremely concerning that it it results into a 65% increase on the problem just because of the way we've established our, our fee structure based on cost of construction. 
So in a sense, they're getting hit double whammy. Our, con our contractors are not only seeing permit fees go up, but the cost of construction go up, cost of everything go up. And then if it's really our intention to try to make it a, a, a more robust environment to get things built, then those things that we can control and those costs we can mitigate, we should be looking at, particularly when it comes to fees. Well, I, and I myself would think of the reason that they connect in uh, the cost of, of building to the fees is because if you if you charge a specific X dollar a fee over a period of years, the the cost of running the permit center would not keep up with inflation. And so uh, they, they, they were trying to break even in the permit center uh, so that they wouldn't have to be subsidized uh, you know in, the, in their annual budget and so the, so I think that's the reason that those fees were, were set on that scale like that. Mr. Carson. Yeah, I'm going to be a broken record today. It sounds like um, I think that I don't know who's tracking the, the topical areas for the housing summit, but there should be a whole track on the conversation of permits and development fees. And then that way we take this on holistically again, get the input of the builders. We have a report from this, the departments on what effect it will have. And then we can be do this in a strategic way relating to all the other planks we're trying to implement. It, unless there's a specific item, that seems the path. And that's on the 12th? No. Is that so not, you he's went? talking about the one that Claire and I are planning okay. for late April, early May. I don't know that we want to wait that long on everything. Um, we're going to meet with, hopefully, once Craig and Lance send us a list of attendees we're going to meet with our big list and and talk about the you know the list of, of priorities we talked about in the was it the rules committee last month um and kind of prioritize those as far as what's easy what's low-hanging fruit that kind of right. stuff so um, for, because again don't want it's to fine for my part what i said yeah. unless there's a specific yeah. item mm -hmm. we should yeah. craft this yeah. into that word yeah. and so yeah. If there's a specific mm -hmm. item, we'll hear yeah. it. That's great. Yeah. But until we have that, mm -hmm. for sure, let's pin this on that board and yeah. make sure it's part of that conversation yeah. because that will get us a time-specific point to address yeah. this issue. And probably it's early summer when that's going to come, late spring. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to plan it, make sure we get all the questions on the table, the expertise, the staffing, the analysis. So... Yeah, my only concern with waiting that long is, um, you know, uh, March, April is when a bulk of it's going to hit because it's right before the construction season. Are we waiting too long? And they've already essentially been, uh, you know, uh, pilfered right. because of this increase in fees. So is there something we can do temporarily, which is as long as if, if our 2023 numbers and budget was established on the income and expenses, can we, can we hold it? Can we hold fees where they are without this dramatic increase that's already set to kick in? Is there some temporary relief we can get until we, we can address this issue in depth? Um, because if we don't do anything, then they're going to go, and we're going to wait till summer, then a bulk of the permitting fees that happen in March through May are just going to get paid. And they're going to, you know, be good for us, but our, will it be uh, the conversation they desperately needed, but a little too late to provide the six some substantial financial relief. So that would be my only concern with waiting. And the argument there then is find a small group and start a drafting project. There you go. Yeah. Sounds like an idea. Sounds like an idea. We do lots of those. <laughs> okay, so do we want to put a subcommittee together then? Or what, what's any, any suggestions from members of the committee? Um, I'd love, I'm open to suggestions on who you would uh, get to in order to have that. I know that um, I've received, you know, um, multiple emails from contractors and stuff discussing this with some details about how that's what they see happening on their end. So, I mean, obviously another roundtable regarding what those fees look like. Um, it would also be nice to hear from, I don't know, you know, I guess the building department on how how their 2023 numbers were, were, and their budget needs were met. Were they based on 
the fee levels of 2022? Were they based on the anticipated increase? I mean, kind of understanding, because I don't want to unintentionally create problems, but I don't think it's the intention of government just, I don't think it's the intention of this department to get as much money as they can and sit on it. We, we should be charging the public an appropriate amount for the job that's being done, and I would say no more. And so with these huge increases kicking in, are we, are we rubbing our hands because there's a windfall, or should we be looking at ways that we can make sure this money is redirected back and stays in the, pub, in the pockets where it belongs? Okay, so so actually, Mr. Solt and then Ross. I was going to just chime in. You can also look back at what you do in 2020. What was that mechanism to hold up that increase that might be a stock? 25%. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Through the chair. So going back. <clears throat> From the billing part, department's per perspective, it, it, any any type of solution we see, we just don't want to have to issue refunds, right? Because if we do this after the fact and we have to issue refunds, that creates like this mountain of work to do. Um, so what's going on here is it's been written in the municipal code that um, permit fees get updated annually every year to reflect this data published in this chart in the ICC building safety journal every August to some effect, right? And and some some years there's been significant increases because I think what they're trying to do is reflect the, the cost of construction nationally, right? And, and Anchorage doesn't necessarily move to what's going on nationally. However, with inflation of building materials and stuff like that, we do. Anyway, but, Bottom line shortage, yeah, there is an increase coming for 23. Um, the, this table has all these different types of construction in it, right? Types of construction that high-rise buildings are built out of, types of construction that grocery stores are built out of, apartment buildings, all the way down to single-family homes. They don't all go up at the same rate. The, the, they'll go up at different rates. So it would really be hard to put a number on it and say, oh, the cost of construction in Anchorage was raised by 10% or 11%, because it really depends on what type of buildings we're building as to how much that cost of construction went up, right? Bottom line short, though, the cost of construction is going to go up. Probably the quickest, easiest, dirtiest thing that the assembly could do is to kind of like take immediate action to not adopt the, 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 the latest table, right? To, to, to stick with the 2022 numbers. Um, and, and our budget was not built on the 23 numbers, right? Our budget was built on the 2022 numbers. All right. So you could argue in a sense that, yeah, okay, if the 2023 numbers were 11% higher, then they would have 11% more income coming in that wasn't accounted for in their budget. Um, Excellent, thank you. And so is, is that something that, so uh, we as a committee want to uh, sponsor and try to get on the agenda as soon as possible. That's something I'm willing to work on. Randy, want to work with me on it? All Anybody right. else? Anybody? Anybody? And get some input from Ross. Sounds like he's got I will. a good idea. Yeah, I mean, but, that's excellent. I really but, appreciate that. But I can point you in the direction to where this is in code, right? <clears throat> so that you can write an ordinance or whatever to address it. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that. That is an extremely reasonable approach that at least we just stay at the 2022 numbers without another increase. And that buys us the time we need for the May housing summit and it allows them to know what their permitting fees are going to be or where we're going to be established because it's based on the previous year. So thank you. Mm -hmm. it sounds like a plan. Let's try to get that together. When is the deadline to get that on the next agenda for the have to have a draft 24th of, of January? Maybe. Yeah, is that, is that next Thursday? Which sounds pretty straightforward. It's today. Well, I mean, it's probably it's today in February. No, not for the 24th. Not for the 24th. No, today is the deadline for the addendum for You're this right. meeting so on the 10th. So next Thursday would be. Yeah, so it next would be Thursday. Next All right. Thursday. All right. So, so, sorry, Ross. Do you know the mechanism that, do that. that stayed off the 2020 increases? Is it similar? They do a similar. For the state? For COVID. Or I, I assume so for the municipality. Uh, Kevin mentioned in 2020. It was a 25% increase, so a decrease. So it was a, it was a yeah, was that decrease in fees. is a discount. COVID discount. Oh, that, that was a COVID, COVID discount yeah. okay. that, the, that the assembly invoked. And at the time of year it came into effect, 
um, it resulted in us having to issue a whole bunch of refunds. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what he's saying. Let's not do it. Right. Even in this situation right here, right, these, these fees kicked in already. The, these 2023 fees kicked in already. So however the assembly wants to handle, fortunately, few permits are coming through yet. You know, they're just kind of trickling in, but yeah. they're, they're really going to start to pick up. So it's kind of like the sooner the better to handle this in terms of minimizing refunds. Yeah. All right, Mr. Shuby. Yeah, to Ross's point, um, I think one of the big hangups when we enacted the COVID uh, fee relief was the assembly's desire to make it retroactive. Mm -hmm. Very appreciative, I'm sure, the industry was, but it created a year and a half long refund process just because uh, SAP and other softwares are very clunky. So, to the extent that the assembly is interested in doing a similar fee reduction, um, my strong encouragement would be to make it retroactive. Yeah, that's one of those situations where you spend more money giving refunds than you would have. Absolutely. So, yeah. so we're looking to simply not adopt the 2023 table. And stay effective on a date. Yeah, of January 1. Yeah, yeah. yeah. unfortunately, yeah. like I say, it's it's in play right now. Yeah. Right? So, so but it's only could... affected a, a small, you know, we're only one week, we're less than a weekend. So yeah, we're, we're only, only a few days. People have been Mm -hmm. You know, um, but this is really going to kick in is probably, like I said, that early spring and, and on your very large, and obviously the larger the project, the larger the fee, since it's based on a price per square foot. Mm -hmm. And so we can just, when we pass this, uh, have the uh, effective date to be the date that it's that it, or signed that by the passes mayor. or, you know, that it's signed by the mayor. Right. That way they know when we pass it on the assembly and they have some preparation to notify accounting and what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So it's not... All right. All right. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, let's go down to the new item we added to the agenda today, the two-year cannabis licensing idea of Mr. Constant. Thank you. So I don't have the draft document yet. Um, Dean and I have been in discussions. I mentioned it at, I think, the Rules Committee meeting. And for the staff to know, we have um, currently an annual licensing process. And there is no requirement for that other than our code says so. And so I am making the move to um, shift us to a biannual licensing process, which will hopefully reduce the workload, make your lives more interesting than always <laughs> chasing the paper of the same application over and over again. And so um, the state hasn't yet moved there, but there's a conversation afoot at the state to do the same thing. I don't believe the state law requires an annual license either, but they work a little more slowly than we do. Uh, we would still receive annual um, reports from the licensee from the state because they would be doing their annual licensing and we would still have to communicate on them. And so um, there's going to be a working group probably going to need some help to make sure that we get the code written properly. But that's the plan. And the plan is to get it into effect before the August licensing period is closed. So, and I, when does it open? Um, they need to, they get notice in May. So May 15th, I usually send the reminder notice. Um, and then they begin submitting June 1st. So it's basically June 1 to August 30. So, um, then that gives us a timeline for this project, which would be hopefully to conclude before, with enough time for applications to be updated. How much time would it take to get all the records updated if we make a code change like that? The documents and the forms. So maybe three weeks, two weeks? Yeah. Two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. So are we planning to uh, work with AMCO on that, or are we going to... Uh, do do this uh, attempt to do this ourselves and then let AMCO know that we did it yeah so AMCO has no role in our licensing requirements and so um, we want them I think to also move with us to the two-year licensing and ideally in the same cycle same timeline so that we're not like on the counter year to them our licenses are effective and then theirs because then we'll have much more duplicate work just responding back and forth um, so ideally we get to the point where the two years is in sync um, but with that said uh, 
it's hard to say. But no, this is a local project. It doesn't require AMCO. But they'll know. I've already let her know. And they that's how I know that they're working similarly on a suite of these changes. Well, and, you know, we, uh, as the state makes changes to, to their uh, marijuana code, you know, the municipality of Anchorage needs to keep track of that. Yeah. So that, so that our operators aren't on a different, uh, you know, aren't operating on, under different laws uh, and rules and regulations than, than other jurisdictions, because that could put us at a competitive disadvantage if we, if we don't. Yeah, well, it'll be aligned, for sure. They're aware, I'm, I've let them know that we're working on this, and they're interested. AMCO's board, the Marijuana Control Board is interested. Um, the other thing, and this is just a stretch goal and probably impossible, but I would love to figure out how to make the alcohol licenses kind of as much as possible line up to one year, and then the marijuana licenses the next year. Right? I know. It's a huge lift. And so it's not within our power to do that. But coming up with a way to do that would be really great because it would become super efficient for everybody. Yeah. State. The licensees, all of us, it just would be <laughs> yeah. rolling. And then new applicants would come in and their license would be shorter. It would term out on that two-year cycle. And then they would be on the two-year cycle. And But that one is a much bigger conversation because anything to do with Title Seven is, or Title Seven at the state of Title Four, um, is challenging. So anyhow, that that's sounds the stretch. Like more of a long-term long goal. Yeah, that's the stretch, but this is the first step. Coming soon. All right. well, we, we have a, that on our radar as well at this point. Um, <clears throat> any other discussion about uh, to your cannabis licensing at this point? And uh, before we go to audience participation, what do we have on our radar that we want to have on our agenda at our next meeting uh, two weeks from now? I, or I think it's, is it exactly two weeks from now, Mandy? Yes. 19th? between now and our next meeting in two weeks. We, mm -hmm. we, we want to keep that on the agenda. Now. And, uh, you know, one thing, there's really nowhere else to discuss this, but I know that Francis is working on the, or maybe it's Tom Davis, is working on the realignment of community councils, mm -hmm. and that timeline is moving pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And so it might be wise for us to add <clears throat> a briefing on that process so that we're in front of it and have been notify it and have a sense so because I know they're seeking input members of the community to participate in the process might be good to get a high level overview of that here we can do that okay is that something you think might be uh, ready in a couple weeks yeah. yeah okay all right let's put that on the agenda for, for the 19th then we'll see what happens with the uh, subcommittee and see if if that is finished and we actually might be on the uh, be set up to be on the agenda for the meeting of the 24th so one other thing we may have i'm assuming we'll have a number of work sessions but the bond process closes on the meeting of the 24th and it, it might be that this could be a venue that's already scheduled to have further conversations about certain projects that might fit within the context of the Planning and Building Department. I don't know that, but you know, I know that the calendar is chock full right now, and so if we have this meeting and it has some bandwidth, it might be a time to have a discussion about certain bonds. I don't know yet. <laughs> Lots of moving parts. I don't know. Yeah, we've got a lot on our plate the next couple of months here. That's for sure. It's really on the agenda. Okay. Well, um, any. Uh, Anyone on the phone or in person that would like to participate? Uh, you have three minutes. Uh, if 
you're on the phone, uh, if you want to mute, it's star six, I believe. I do have a, a question for long range planning since Whitfield, his team's here. Um, you know, last year I was surprised to see that several platting board uh, <coughs> meetings have been canceled just due to a lack of development. How are you looking for 2023? How is your department? What you, are you seeing a, a significant increase in development construction? Can you kind of tell me, based on your years of experience in that department, how that? What you project is, uh, in, as far as what's taking place in Acres, because you kind of have an advantage point that you see terms things of, <coughs> years to in advance. Through the chair, uh, Mr. Cross, in terms of applications. Applications, uh, things moving forward. We're seeing a slight decrease in the number of applications from previous years Okay. Uh, right now. Our hope, obviously, is that we see uh, that pick up. Uh, we <coughs> want to see more responsible development happening in Anchorage. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some of that is out of our control. Yeah. So, you know, we're working on a, a number of projects, um, you know, amendments to Title 21 that we hope will incentivize more more development in Anchorage, and you know that hopefully will generate applications and and more uh, public meetings, you know, at the Planning and Zoning Commission or at the Planning Board. So, yeah. And most of the things out of your control being. <clears throat> Uh, the costs associated with it, the lack of labor, uh, different economic factors that correct that drive yeah. that. Yeah, not necessarily I mean the, just obviously the, the the cost of materials right now is um, you know, much higher than it was say three or four years ago. Not much we can do about that. But certainly we can uh, look at amendments to Title Twenty One, um, and we're doing that to uh, to incentivize more more development. All right. Well, thank you very much. So, so as, as the price of building materials started to moderate, I've, I've heard that it's not going up as fast anymore. I don't know if that's true or not. Do, do anybody have information on that? Yeah, I, I've heard the bu building materials are starting to moderate, but now the cost of the debt has gone through the roof. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. With, you know, with interest rates going up, uh, uh, cost of housing uh, is, is. I don't see how it can't continue to to increase. So sometimes you're, so short-term credit for a builder, uh, say they're a roofing contractor, a siding contractor where they're purchasing the materials and hope to get paid back in 90 to 120 days, depending on what their billing cycle looks like. Usually it's two point two and a quarter above the Wall Street Journal Prime, which is at 9%. So, I mean, they can be looking at right now on short-term credit, just where they can go to North Rim or whoever their line of credit is for construction. They're forking out the sixty eighty thousand dollars $80,000 in materials that hopefully they get paid back. But now that interest has gone up from six to seven percent, and it's almost doubled in, in a year. And so now your contractors are reluctant to uh, extend their neck out that far because now that's interest charges that they have. So what they're requiring is now more of them are requiring uh, more fifty percent down, sixty percent down, or they're just not quoting materials because the material costs have been fluctuating, particularly on anything that's been based on asphalt because we have a shortage of diesel fuel, you know, asphalt comp shingles, things like that. So. Um, means they're not quoting materials. They'll quote labor. Labor is good for 90 days, but until I buy materials, you're not getting material quotes. And so, like the whole construction industry right now is really getting beaten like a like like a pinata. You know, it's 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 really tough for contractors, particularly your smaller mid-range contractors that don't have that aren't sitting on huge amounts of cash. They're really really struggling, struggling to find workers, having to pay them a premium, the short-term credits through the roof, and then. You know, you might couple onto these some of these permitting fees, and so that's what we're trying to identify. What are those things we can do to help them survive, and um, and push through it? Yeah, it's it's they're being attacked on a multitude of uh, different areas, and and that's could have uh, could be one of the reasons why we're having fewer permits. Uh, yeah, if you don't have requested. money to do it, you just don't do it. I know the permit valuation is up. We're about twenty eight percent over last year. But that could be related to the cost of materials, etc., which else. increase the prices right. to do right. a percentage of your cost. All right. All right. Well, hopefully, this island is in summit. We can brainstorm some, some solutions. Thank you.
All right. Any, anyone else for uh, anything else for audience participation? If not, I'll take a motion for adjournment. So moved. Motion to move. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>